Colonel Mark Martins of the United States Army's International and Operational Law Division. Um, I'd like to join the, the chorus, enthusiastically join the chorus in thanking uh, Georgetown Law's Human Rights Institute, the uh, University of Virginia School of Law, and the Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School for this excellent conference, as well as to thank the, the Dash family. I, too, admired and, and studied uh, uh, the important uh, Sam Dash contribution to human rights. Um, the task of this panel is to address military involvement in the rule of law and, we hope, encourage a vigorous discussion uh, among both the panel and the audience on the risks <clears throat> of such involvement and on the reasons for it. And we've had, we've had some significant discussion of these themes already, but we hope to, to uh, take another layer deeper into the discussion. As Tom Nockbar suggested at the outset, if Panel 1's focus was the rule of law effort on the ground, you know, granular, what's happening for brigades and others, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations on the ground, and Panel 2's focus was institutional arrangements, both uh, interagency within our own government and international uh, for rule of law efforts, then uh, this panel really is hoping to get at uh, more fundamental questions, Tom said at an abstract level, but yes, at a, at a level of generality, uh, maybe philosophical is another word uh, for discussing it, uh, certain dynamics such as why the military has tended to get into modern rule of law efforts at all, uh, the risks of mil uh, military involvement, for instance, uh, to the development uh, to the development of rule of law itself and to underlying civil military relations, what risks government involvement and this would include involvement by contractors of governments or proxies for governments, what risks those pose to uh, non governmental efforts and to rule of law govern uh, efforts writ large, uh, whether there are new approaches, new and different approaches that might better serve U.S. national security interests, the development of the rule of law, the protection of individual human rights, or other laudable aims. And if so, if there are new approaches, if there are new ways to bring this community of interest together uh, in an effective way, then what are those approaches? What might they require? And what might they imply? And what risks might they pose? Uh, the first of the diverse perspectives here to address this and other relevant matters is Aaron Belkin. He is Associate Professor of International Relations, Identity, and Civil Military Relations at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Among uh, other professional credentials, Professor Belkin is co-director of the new Eisenhower Research Project, an initiative based at the Watson Institute at Brown that will study the militarization of American culture. Uh, our, next, our second panelist is Dave Crane, currently professor of practice at Syracuse University College of Law. He teaches there international criminal law, international humanitarian law, and national security law. Among many other experiences in a lifetime of service, Professor Crane was from 2002 to 2005 the chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone an international war crimes tribunal with responsibility for trying alleged war criminals in Sierra Leone's civil war. Our third panelist is Major General Charles Dunlop, currently the Deputy Judge Advocate General of the United States Air Force, with professional oversight and leadership responsibilities for 2,200 judge advocates, 350 civilian attorneys, and 1,900 military and civilian paralegals worldwide. Among General Dunlap's uh, major publications, ma uh, many major publications, are a recent assessment of Field Manual 3-24, which is the 2006 counterinsurgency manual, as well as a widely cited 1994 article in the Wake Forest Law Review, Welcome to the Junta, the Erosion of Civilian Mil uh, Control of the U.S. Military. I like that. Our fourth panelist is Bill Stubner, presently the Director of Civil Military Operations at the Louis Berger Group. 
among many experiences relevant to our topic here today, uh, Director Stubner was consultant to the United States Institute of Peace in efforts to establish a truth commission in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2005 and 2006, service as the executive director for the Alliance for International Conflict Prevention and Resolution, uh, and many other contributions to a wide variety of international and U.S. interagency efforts throughout a long career, which included 20 years as an Army officer. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Professor Belkin. Thank you so much uh, for the um, generous introduction and to the Dash uh, family and to the organizers of the conference, in particular Rosa Brooks, for the invitation. I, uh, I once uh, flew across the country to a conference with 4,000 people and um, there were only three people in my breakout session, and uh, two, two of them were my parents. Um, so I am I'm very grateful for the for the robust audience and the outstanding conference. I want to make three simple points today, but I want to start uh, with a poll, a survey, unscientific, of course. And I'd just like to ask uh, for a show of hands of how many people think there's a decent chance that we're going to leave a stable democracy in Iraq. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not voting. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand a lot of the hands that didn't go up were, uh, were abstentions. Um, I want to refer back to that uh, uh, pseudo or unscientific survey in a minute in the context of my three points. The first point is going to be about predictions and the game of darts. The second is going to be about the militarization of American culture. And then third, I'm going to tie my remarks back to the conversation that we've been having for the past few hours. So first of all, prediction and the game of darts. I come to you um, with the utmost humility on many levels. Um, I've never served in the military. I defer uh, to the great expertise and the leadership of those who have. But even more so, I come to you out of humility for my field, uh, political science. A professor uh, named Phil Tetlock published a book a few years ago that was based on a forecasting tournament over 20 years. He asked several hundred foreign policy experts, mostly political scientists, to make predictions about international relations. And he found that, on average, the professors were no more accurate at predictions than a chimpanzee throwing darts at a dartboard. Uh, that is true. Um, we are not very good at making judgments about the future. That having been said, I'd also like to direct your attention to an advertisement that a group of about 30 professors of international relations took out in the New York Times in June of 2002. And these were pretty much the top specialists in the field of international relations, at least academically. And they were urging the Bush administration not to go to war in Iraq. And they made six or seven predictions, um, all, of one, all but one of which were right. And the most prescient, I think, was the prediction that we shouldn't go to war in Iraq because Iraq is fundamentally ungovernable. And whether or not we won on the battlefield, we would simply have no way to control the country. Now, all of us, of course, probably think of Saddam Hussein as one of the great tyrants of modern political life a dictator, a brutal dictator, genocidal dictator. That having been said, I want to make the claim that the reason that Saddam Hussein was Saddam Hussein was not just because he was a bad person, but because, of course, he ruled in a bad neighborhood. There had been about 20 coups, military coups, or attempted coups in the 20 years before he came to power. A colleague and I published an empirical statistical study in the Journal of Conflict Resolution. And we came up with a coup risk score that you can apply to any country in the world. It's almost like a cholesterol test. It tells the, the background risk of whether a country would have a coup d'etat if the dictator 
we're not using Band-Aid strategies, uh, coup minimization strategies, to kind of keep a lid on problems. So kind of deep underlying structural coup risk. And we found before we measured, we used our metric to measure every country in the world, we found that before the war, Iraq had one of the lowest, uh, worst coup risk scores in the world, which meant that if Saddam Hussein ever stopped using his Band-Aid strategies like executing top generals, uh, pitting his various armies against one another, etc., if he stopped using those, the country would be very ripe for a coup. I want to argue now that, and this is, will conclude my first point, that we've been having a conversation today about whether the promotion of the rule of law in Iraq should be conducted by boots on the ground or wingtips, whether we should have a civilian face on promotion of the rule of law efforts or not, whether and how to be sensitive or not. I want to claim that none of these matter. There is no hope for the rule of law in Iraq. Iraq has never had rule of law. It does not have rule of law. And no matter what we do there, it will not have the rule of law. Because even if we leave a democracy in place, that democracy will be overthrown by a coup shortly thereafter. And we will have another Saddam Hussein in place, either nationally or a bunch of little Saddam Husseins. So that's my point about predictions and darts. Second of my three points is about the militarization of the question that we're asking today at today's conference. I want to claim that the question that has served as the organizing principle for this conference is militarized and that the militarization of that question has distorted our conversation. In order to develop that point, which will be my third point, I want to explain what it means to say that something is militarized, at least in my own view, not speaking for anyone else. So what is militarization, and what do I mean that our question is militarized, and then how has that militarization distorted our conversation? Militarization is complicated, and it refers to many different dimensions. And most scholars who study militarization see it as the uncritical glorification, not just of the military as an institution, but of military values and of the use of force and of foreign policy based on use of force. Not that any of those things are bad, but we're talking here about a lack of healthy skepticism, about uncritical glorification. For example, the notion that soldiering is the epitome of citizenship and the epitome of Americanness. And if you want to prove your Americanness, what you need to do is not be a teacher, not be a rape crisis counselor, not be a diplomat, not be a policeman, but be a soldier. It's the idea that going to an air show with your children and looking at the beautiful planes, and they are beautiful, is something that you do without ever raising questions about what those airplanes are used for. Militarization can be very subtle. It can come across in the design of cars, like Hummers, in children's clothing. And it can also be at a macro political level. Political debates can be militarized. For example, when John Kerry stepped out in front of the television cameras in Boston in 2004, to accept the Democratic nomination for president, the first thing he did was saluted and said, reporting for duty. That was militarization. Before the Afghan war, we did not have a conversation in this country at all, not a single conversation, I would argue, about whether war was the appropriate response to 911. Now, you can claim that it was, and you can claim that it wasn't, but we didn't even ask the question as to whether perhaps thinking of the episode as a diplomatic problem or a law enforcement problem would be more effective. These are examples of conversations, toys, cars, and clothes that get militarized. Most scholars of, I shouldn't say that, many scholars of militarization in American society believe that the country has become dangerously Militarized Again, not because there's any disrespect for the military, but because 
it's potentially corrosive of the democratic deliberative process to have a highly militarized society in which healthy skepticism is not exercised. And it's also, according to scholars, bad for the military when society is overly militarized. For example, some people argue that excessive militarization goes hand in hand with military contempt for civilian society. So that's what militarization is. I want to conclude in my third point, briefly, by making the claim that the way that we have framed the question at today's conference and the way that we have structured our conversation has distorted our understanding of the promotion of rule of law and the best course of action. How has it done that? A couple of ways. First of all, the way that we have structured the, the question, uh, how should we promote rule of law? Should the military be involved with the rule of law? Th those are our questions. That question conceals a fundamental contradiction, which is that while the military, of course, has historically played important and noble efforts in promoting the rule of law, the military has also, both domestically and internationally, played an incredibly destructive role, I would argue, in undermining the rule of law. And I'm glad to specify what I mean in question and answer period, but I would argue that we should be having a conversation, a simply descriptive conversation, about the extent to which the military promotes rule of law and the conditions under which that happens, and the conditions under which the military undermines the rule of law at home and abroad. A second way in which the militarization of the question has distorted our conversation is that has, it has grossly decontextualized our efforts to promote the rule of law in Iraq, as if our efforts to promote the rule of law there took place in a vacuum and were the most important thing about our occupation of the country. I would claim that whether or not rule of law promotion is carried out by civilians or by the military is less important than our use of rule of law rhetoric at this conference and elsewhere to sanitize the occupation in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Belkin. Professor Crane. Thank you for those comments. I think that's going to make a really uh, the beginning of a great debate for the rest of the afternoon because it'll certainly wake wake most of us up. And uh, <laughs> I used to teach at the Judge Advocate General School. I was the chief of the International Law Division, and then I put the word operational into it. And uh, obviously, you are all doing very well, and I'm very proud of all of you doing that. But I. I've also looked out in the room, and I see many friends, many former students, and many, many colleagues. A couple of you, I, I do specifically recall teaching you the, and actually watching you uh, understand the term total muscle failure uh, during the airborne PT program that I used to run when I was there. Uh, you look a lot older than the last time I saw you, which means I don't even want to know what I look like. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to discuss all of this, all the parameters of this, to pause and to think about where we're going. Uh, the rule of law kind of run, rolls off our tongue, and I'm going to ask a question towards the end of my remarks. Uh, what does that mean? What does rule of law mean? It's like an orange. You know, we just kind of say it, and we haven't really paused long enough to consider what that means to other people. And I think that that's going to be fundamental as to how we start to structure our thinking uh, in this area. Uh, I do also want to thank the sponsors. Rosa, again, thank you for allowing me to come down. I'm a little, a little kind of uneasy here. You know, I teach at Syracuse University, and here I am in Georgetown. So uh, if I'm not around tomorrow, uh, you might want to call Rosa and find out where I disappeared to. Uh, but I would like to say that Syracuse is in the big dance. <laughs> Uh, with those uh, introductory remarks, <laughs> the last thing I will say is if you're going to fall asleep during my portion, I would like for you to move to the back of the room and get in the front leaning rest position. <laughs> Colonel Taylor? Okay. 
I preface my remarks uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a title. I always like to have a title because it really focuses me. Uh, I have two titles. The first one is Ready, Shoot, Aim. Uh, the next one is Can't Do, Sir. And with that, let me just set the context. You know, we're coming out of what I consider and what I teach. I teach uh, atrocity law and policy as well up at Syracuse University College of Law. I teach, uh, uh, we, we focus on what I call the bloody century, the 20th century, where uh, my research finds that uh, over 200, and of course this is, could be off by 25% either way, over 235 million human beings died uh, during this time frame. Uh, 115 to 120 uh, died at the hands of their own governments. That's a lot of people, an incredible number of people. Uh, I'm starting to think that perhaps World War I and World War II are misnamed, and I'm starting to do some thinking and writing, which is always dangerous for me because I've got to put crayons down and start using a pen. But uh, why don't we call it the Great War? the war of the century, because if you think historically, that may in reality have been the same thing. But it doesn't matter because the horror story was incredible, because uh, the Cold War was a part of, the, of that great war. And so if you think about it, we almost had our second hundred years war in uh, the history of uh, Western civilization. The 21st century uh, is going to be incredibly challenging in many, many ways. We're going to see dirty little wars. Uh, war, I'm saying, is euphemistically, uh, um, not armed conflict. We're just going to see these messy little places and dark corners of the world uh, where we're going to be forced to do something because we're the only country in the world that actually can do something about it, maybe. Uh, these little conflicts uh, and wars and what have you are becoming increasingly uncivilized. I would say that we're actually moving away from the laws of armed conflict. We may follow the laws of armed conflict, but there are not many others that do. And that's going to be a challenge. We're going to be thinking about that. We've been evolving, if you follow the Toffler model of first wave, second wave, third wave. And I remember teaching this in the graduate course in a course that I called the Legal Aspects of Future War. And I teach a seminar like that up at Syracuse, where we move from the industrial age to the information age. I'm not sure what all of this means. Uh, but of course, before that, we had a thing called the agrarian age. Uh, I think we're going back. And there are some reasons for that, which I will discuss when I talk about the threat. But we really may be an information age army fighting an agrarian age threat. And that's problematic for a lot of things. Perfect example. The first information age army that took to the field, and I say army, I really mean armed forces, uh, defeated a industrial age army in 100 hours after a month-long air campaign. And then we went to Somalia and got our butts kicked by a guy with a cell phone, a, sp a spear, a shield, and an AK-47, an agrarian age type of, of, uh, of threat. Well, what is this threat now that we're going to start be thinking of? Because this all ties into the rule of law and how the Army is going to have to deal with it, but also the importance of uh, the civilian aspect of this. Well, we're going to see economic nationalism begin to rear its ugly head. It already has started. I think people are going to start hunkering down based on the economic threat that we have around the world. We're also going to see, as we move forward, because we're not moving fast enough to solve it, uh, commodity wars. We're going to start hoarding food. We're going to start thinking about water. Water is going to become like gasoline, uh, a precious commodity. It already is in many parts of the world, and I think that is going to continue. We're also going to be have to face something I call the Noah effect. We're starting to melt. Uh, my wife was just at the Maldives last week, and she was on official business, and she uh, uh, paid an official visit out there. And uh, you, if you know the Maldives, it's several hundreds of islands, and there's just slowly, one at a time, disappearing. I might make that a little dramatic, but they are starting to go away. And so the Maldivian government is working with India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh to 
carve out a piece of the Maldives somewhere else. Isn't that an interesting concept, and how are we going to play a part of that? But uh, it's certainly going to impact on all nations that have a coast, and uh, there's going to be problems related to that. So how do we counter uh, these, uh, these evolving, never uh, thought of threats? Well, what we'll see is, is that as, as we see uh, economic nationalism, commodity wars, this NOAA effect as we melt, the development of what we call shantytown states, and that could be even shantytown continents, as, as, uh, as part of the world which has resources reacts and saves itself, uh, other parts of the world will be unable to save itself. And so we're going to actually literally see uh, some type of shantytown effect. Maybe not, but these are just things to be thinking about. So these are the, these are the real threats that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, terrorists. Uh, they're a group of criminals that are biting our ankles right now. And yeah, they can take down a couple buildings and stuff. But uh, I think Colin Powell had it right. Uh, that you know, just because we have individuals who can take down a few buildings, we don't have to change our entire way of life in reaction to that, and I, or he said it's something like that, but I thought he was exactly right. Well, is the solution kinetic energy? You know, over the past eight years, we've been shooting first and asking questions later. Uh, I would counter that it is not, that in reality, as we've been discussing throughout these excellent panels, that uh, we need to civilianize our uh, reaction to these threats. Uh, military has very little play in this unless someone like the Brits reinvade us and march down Pennsylvania Avenue. But I don't see a huge role for the military in these threats other than if someone is trying to uh, attack us kinetically. We have the capability, and I think that that was mentioned by the general in the second panel. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we should. And I think that's very, very important. So guns and kinetic energy are not the solution in my mind. I like the term that Secretary Clinton said. It's called smart power. Uh, we've heard, we, of course, those of us who've been in the business, we've heard it called soft power, but it's the same thing. But smart power talks about civil engagement uh, and uh, and getting out there with other approaches to the threats that, that face us. Maybe even try to prevent it before it happens, as opposed to react to it uh, after it happens. So, in my mind, I see a trend that, and, and Secretary Gates has even mentioned this, that. Uh, the civilian aspect of our federal government, whatever that may be, through USAID, Department of State, and other Department of Justice, what have you, uh, we might see, hopefully we'll see, I'd like to see uh, a building up of those assets and resources to the diminution of the Department of Defense. I would like to see a shifting of this uh, incredibly important uh, department, but I think that in order to face the new challenges, uh, we're not going to need armored divisions. We're not going to need uh, uh, vast amounts of carrier battle groups or, uh, or fleets of planes to the extent that we're facing some type of industrial age army. Now, granted, you're probably saying, well, what's about China? Well, if you think about China, if we're going to go to war with China, uh, we're going to start using nukes as well. I mean, are we going to take on China militarily? Uh, I think that that's a red herring. So, in my mind, I would like to see the military as used as a last resort in pretty much anything. Take all of the civil military uh, mission that we tend to grab all the time and give it to the right people and only have a smaller, well-trained, more lethal, technologically superior to any army in the world, agile and flexible group of what I like to call star warriors. You know, when the U.S. military shows up, negotiations have failed. It's the last resort. And so we use them in a way that, uh, that are effective, uh, make the point, defend the nation, uh, and provide a diplomatic tool, but it is always the last resort. So what I'm saying is ask questions first and shoot maybe later, if at all. And the military has to say, and look at the civilian leadership, can't do, sir. You say can do. I mean, I was in the military, and everything I did was I can do. And I went and did it and did it to the best of my ability. But we're really going to have to start saying can't do or uh, force the military to say can't do or take away the things that they don't need 
to make them a more efficient, agile, and effective tool of national security, but not one where we're everywhere, all the time, and always the first resort. The question I might ask, are we beginning to see the end of our military as we know it? Uh, I don't know. That's a rhetorical question which we can talk about. And lastly, my fifth point is, is that uh, we also have to consider the rule of law. What does rule of law mean? Uh, I was in West Africa, arrived at a place that was totally devoid of law at all. There was no law. It was Mad Max Thunderdome. And over a period of three years, as I began to show the people through town hall meetings, literally walking the countryside, I talked to them about three things. The law is fair, no one is above the law, and the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. And I said, don't believe what I say, watch what I do. And one of the examples is indicting the sitting president of Liberia, Charles Taylor. Uh, but the question I want to pose to you, and I will stop, is that is the justice, parentheses, rule of law we seek, the justice slash rule of law they want? Thank you. Thank you. General Dunlap. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Mark, for the kind introduction. Let me tell you something. If you're ever on a panel, th these are tough acts to follow because they have, my friend Aaron has given us a lot to think about. And I would su just suggest, I know it's going through some of the military minds out there with a few of the things he said. Don't jump to the conclusion that you may be jumping to. If you have a question, ask them. I think you're going to get a little bit of a different answer. David's raised some very interesting, in fact, they both raised issues that are worthy of conferences in and of themselves. And I would like to thank Georgetown and, and the Dash family and the Army School for presenting a conference that raises these issues in way. I go to a lot of these conferences, and honestly, there are trees dying for nothing on the, you know, on their agendas and things like this. But if nothing else, just hearing those two guys. Now, having said that, and I do appreciate that that Rosa gave that overall disclaimer. Uh, I found that in my life, I'd better reiterate that I'm only speaking for myself and not the Air Force and not the Department of Defense or all of the above. Uh, and I'd like to get back to some of our original questions, because what they said does relate. When Aaron talks about militarization, it actually goes to one of the issues. Why is it that the military is taking the lead in building the rule of law? Well, I think the orthodox answer is, and General Crowley gave in his article, I think, in October of 2007, because, hey, we in uniform know it should be civilians but we're the only game in town right now. And from a military perspective, in conflicts in the 21st century, you can't leave, you can't go home until the rule of law has been reestablished. So we have an imperative to do it, but it's more than that. I think the American people want us to do it. You know, James Fallows wrote an article about 20 years ago about the military. This is before the first Gulf War, before the Renaissance, so to speak, in the public consciousness of the military. And he said something along the lines that, you know, in this country, we like to turn everything into a national defense problem and give it to the military to solve because they tend to get things done. There is a thirst in American society to see things in government work. That is the reason that just recently there was a Harris poll that had confidence in military leadership is the highest of all other institutions in government, including, and this ought to disturb us, frankly, including the institutions that are expected to exercise control over the military. There's more trust in the military than there is in organized religion. Is that a good thing for a democracy? And so I think part of the reason is that the American people kind of want us doing it because they think that we're going to do it right. And that's not a reason for us to continue to do it, but as we assess how we got to where we are, we have to take that into account. Uh, what are the risks? I think we 
we talked about some of that. Uh, it was a previous panel talk. Well, you know, if you're trying to imprint on a, on a country emerging, you know, the values of democracy, and you have somebody in uniform doing it, what are you imprinting on them? It's like even when we do humanitarian stuff, you're imprinting on these societies, some of which may be very um, rudimentary societies, the idea that it's people in uniform that get things done. And so is that really what has made the United States a great country? In fact, is it what's made the United States military as powerful as it is? Do you think that Bill Gates would have ever made it in the United States Army? I don't think so. There's an element of our society that has to be wearing uniforms, but the vast majority of the society where we draw our strength from, it's because people have an attitude that ain't going to work in the an entrepreneurial, free-thinking kind of attitude that makes the free enterprise system such an engine to support the kind of military we have. So, so we do have these inconsistencies, not really inconsistencies, but just factors of our society. But as I said before during the question, quite honestly, in my experience, you go to some of these societies and you could have all the civilians there yourself, there you want. And until they hear one of us in uniform say, yeah, this is, you got to listen to this guy, they're not going to listen because they've come up, they, and they are shocked sometimes when they see a totalitarian, if they come from a totalitarian background, when somebody in uniform is really talking seriously about a civilian being in charge. So I think that's part of the reality. I have a little different view of the future than Dave does. I think that there are people, every time we start thinking that the last war is going to be the future, it's going to be a problem. I think we have adversaries out there who clapped in glee when they saw the new Army's new stability operations manual. They want the United States Army to put stability operations on a par with combat operations because they aren't, think, they aren't worried about the United States Army occupying their country and controlling their government. They are worried about the combat power of the United States Army. So if the United States Army reorganizes itself into a constabulary force, they're very happy about that. And if we start thinking that there aren't adversaries out there, I'll tell you, a lot of our adversaries know who they wake up worrying about. Of course, I'll say the United States Air Force. <laughs> What's the, one of the most unpopular weapon systems around? No, never gets any good press. Nuclear attack submarines. But let me tell you something. There are some pretty serious people that wake up worrying about United States Navy attack submarine force because that means that they can't do things that they would like to do. As we get into this area of the future where there is these these challenges to resources and environment and everything else, we have to have a military that it will push off the table the option of using kinetics. We, we have to project to the rest of the world that you better not even think about using kinetics. But that then talks about what are the risks as we try to develop these other kinds of capabilities, and we have to somehow rationalize that. You know, uh, we had previous speaker talk about, you know, we used to have 16,000 people in the a AID or whatever. And Dave, I'm with you. I, if we can avoid sending 19-year-olds into combat, give them, you know, let's move the resources around. But we got to get some metrics that shows that, that that works. You know, you go to these conferences and one of the bumper sticks are, is, you know, there are more people in military bands than there is in the Foreign Service. Well, let me tell you something, folks. You start having success with, in terms of relating to other countries as good as our military bands do, and I'll be glad to send, you know, turn them into Foreign Service officers. Where is the metric of success? We talk about we need more foreign aid. That seems intuitive to me, but you know what a lot of foreign aid is? We give money to an NGO. The people on the receiving end don't even know it's a gift to the American people. So I'm in favor of that. 
but let's have some metrics to show that it achieves the objective that we have for it. And so that's how we in the military can get out of it, and that's how the American people will have confidence if some demonstration that these alternative futures will have the success. So, okay, well, we are where we are. How do we deal with it? I'll close with a couple things. We have been talking about, well, let's get a bunch of civilians and we'll train them up and we'll send them over. I don't think that we're ever going to get there because you all heard what they're talking about. They're talking about less than a battalion worth of civilians, 100 and then 500. We're talking, Afghanistan has 24 million people. Iraq has 22 million people. You can't run D.C. with 500 people. There must be, how many people in D.C. government? 16,000, I think I saw, saw, saw somewhere. So what I think we need to do is we need to start thinking, how can we do this as a small footprint? And so maybe part of the answer is the Army had led a contract for $4 billion for translators in Iraq. Maybe an idea what would be take a billion of that, bring 10,000 Iraqis here where we don't have all those concerns about security and trying to train an anthropologist to shoot a gun and all that other kind of thing, and bring them here, put them in a secure environment where they can really focus, they can learn the language, and they can learn the administrative skills that they need to take back to their country to help rebuild the rule of law and everything else in civilian society. And, you know, what about this country is one of the leaders in online education. Why don't we build, take Andy Krepinevich, his uh, oil spot strategy, you guys have read the foreign affairs article, which is kind of what Mark did in Iraq when he built the rule of law. Now, he's going to say it wasn't me, it was every, you know, because he just wants to give other people credit. But the rule of law green zone. In other words, you build a secure education zone, and then you use things like interactive VTCs, where the instructors are back in this country because people don't want to go over there. They're back in this country, they're speaking the language, and they're, they're teaching, use some of this billions of dollars of telecommunications capability we have in the armed forces to figure out how can we do this within our existing resources with a small footprint. Because I'm afraid that if our answer is going to be we're going to have this 10,000-person civilian reserve force or whatever. It's just not going to happen because when and, – and part of it is, I think, Aaron, you know, we don't expect civilians to go places where you don't want to go. You know, we in the military are just – it's a cultural thing that we just do what we tell. We go where we want to go. And I can tell you, I've personally been in places where I wouldn't be there but for the fact I was in the military. And I'm afraid that if we try to depend on this deployable capability, it's okay if it's a, it's a, you know, a, a relatively safe area because they are brave Americans and they do willing to make sacrifices. But there comes a point at which people aren't going to get on that airplane. Civilians are not going to get on that airplane. It's not going to be them. It's going to be their families and everyone else who haven't bought in to that, what the Supreme Court talks about you know, the ultimate, you know, the ultimate contract. Because the Supreme Court, you know, civilians can always say, you know, I'm out of here. I'm finished. I'm not going to do it. But in the military, the Supreme Court says the rights of men in the armed forces per force must yield to the overwhelming demands of discipline and duty. So... That's the paradigm that, that we're working with in that we have to work through solutions that don't require thousands of Americans going to a foreign country uh, to rebuild the rule of law or other kinds of institutions. We've got to get smarter about it. And I would suggest that we take a look at what's happening in Colombia and, and the advances that have been done there. Small footprint. It costs us $5 billion, relatively cheap, few American lives. Have there been bumps in the road? Absolutely. Are there problems? Yes. Have they reestablished the rule of law? In a lot of ways, I think that they can be very – I'll tell you, you go to a Colombian military and you give them a I – would, I would be scared to give our flag officers the test on Geneva Conventions and human rights laws that 
Colombian senior officers have to take to qualify, you know, for all the all the things that we put on. So I'll quit right there and just some other ideas to think about. Boy, bad cleanup, clean up on a day like this, <laughs> you know, it's pretty bad stuff. But uh, Rosa kind of did me in because I think she only brings me in for comic relief. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I've been accused of being a war criminal, which maybe I'm the only person in the room. Although maybe with some of the recent wars, that's that's not the case. And by the way, on your one thing that you said, General, uh, the Marines would say, yeah, Gates could be could make it in the Army, uh, not the Marine Corps. Uh, Keep in mind, I said Bill Gates, not the other one. Oh, but uh, and, and that's the secret I want to pass on to my Army colleagues. And it's a secret that I never understood while I was on active duty, but I spent a lot of time at the Marine Corps schoolhouse in the last few years. And, you know, the Marines actually are the intellectuals of the military. It's just that they work really, really hard to hide that. <laughs> but they've been doing a lot of thinking, and, and some of it I think is pretty good. And I didn't know that uh, General Dunlap had been involved in the counterinsurgency manual. But uh, I came in the Army actually the same day, as, or not the same day, but the same time as Dave Crane. I graduated a little bit early. Uh, and we came from the same place. And at that time, we were all preparing for the Southeast Asian Games. You know, it was late in the season, and all of us were reading the things that I think that we thought we needed to read. We were trying to get ready. We were all scared to death. And uh, one of the writings that was pointed out to me at the time, which I really studied, was uh, by David Galula. And I, I know the counterinsurgency manual references Galula. And how many people here have read Galula on counterinsurgency? I'm glad to see a few have. But, you know, you see today very few people have. I guess the point I want to make about that is, you know, I like the new counterinsurgency manual, but I think Dave Petraeus would be the first one to say there is nothing new in the manual. Uh, you can read Galula. You can go to the Marine Corps Small Wars Manual, which they've republished now. Now, if we don't get enough Marines to learn how to read so they can read it, it would be great. But um, the thing is, one of the things Dave always likes to say, and I like this because I learned this the hard way for fi after five years in El Salvador, and that's that you can't kill your way out of an insurgency. Uh, what I usually tell civilian audiences and, and, and by the way, I was going to try to piss everyone off, but Aaron's already done that, so he took that role. <laughs> but um, a chance. Well, but I usually, what I like to tell civilian audiences is, thank goodness, in our society, the warmongers are not the guys in uniform. Typically, they're elected or they're political appointees, and they wear coats and ties. And 99 times out of 100, they've never been there. They don't see the results of, of what this is all about. So, uh, you know, I've got kind of a soft spot in my heart for the military guys. And I know that most of us are not the ones promoting these kinds of solutions. Most of us understand that the military is, is and should be a last resort. You know, I'm not a pacifist. I do think that sometimes there is evil in the world and you have to address it. But... We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be the first answer, and sometimes lately I think people have taken this at the, as the first answer. My big experience, because Dave and I came in right at the end of the Southeast Asian Games, uh, I had just a brush with it, but then I went off, quite frankly, to prepare to, to fight World War II on the plains of Europe which is what most people in my generation did. If you, if you weren't in a mechanized infantry or armor or mechanized artillery unit, you weren't going to get ahead. Because, boy, we were going to fight the Red Army and we were going to beat them. Thank goodness we had the Air Force because that was our only hope. But late in my career, I left those plains of Europe and got involved in El Salvador. A dirty little rotten, stinking conflict that many people would argue perhaps we should never have been involved in. And that's, uh, that's when I first met Ari and I, or a mutual friend that, that brought Rose and me together. Uh, but I guess I realized back during that time 
uh, since, since we had started our careers with a loss, I guess what I was doing the whole time was trying to figure out why we lost and what might work. And I guess I've never gotten out of that yet. But I spent five years in the war in El Salvador, and I've got to tell you from the rule of law approach, and I do believe after all these years of looking at things, if you don't have a rule of law, you don't have anything. Uh, I wasted my first two years. It's not that I didn't kill guerrillas for the first two years. We did that, and we got better and better and better at it. But like Dave likes to say, you can't kill your way out of an insurgency. And if you kill the wrong people, what ends up happening is you create ten enemies for every one that you've gotten rid of. And that's the epitome of what some people used to call fuzzy math. That's not a way to win. It took me, you know, I'm a slow learner. It took me two years to understand that I couldn't convince Salvadoran officers in that stinking, rotten war not to violate people's rights. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't tell them that, look, this is the Geneva Convention. Uh, this is not right because it didn't mean anything in that context. Uh, and, you know, those of us in the old army, you know, we all went to the obligatory once a year meeting where you you watch the, the Law of Land Warfare film and you had the young JAG captain who got the right. He pulled the, the short end of the stick and he had to come in and, and talk to a bunch of board soldiers about rule of law. And then we'd all walk out and forget it. Uh, that's what I was probably doing the first two years in El Salvador. And then the light bulb kind of went off. What you had to do is you had to teach people that this is not practical. If you're going to kill prisoners, then who's going to surrender? You know, some people will because they've always got that slight hope that you're not going to abuse them. But a lot of people are going to fight just that much harder. If you abuse the population, then you have forgotten that the population is the key terrain and that the only way to win is to convince them that they are more secure and going to be happier in the long run with you than they are with the other guys. We also had to learn that the most important thing, and I, I had a special little unit that wasn't particularly big, but we we had to learn that you had to win people over more than you had to kill people. That was so much more effective and, and so much more helpful. Um, eventually, we got that. And all it was, frankly, was going back to what had always been American principles. You know, we, at one time, we were that shining city on the hill. Uh, my wife is an immigrant. I've worked overseas most of my life. The image that we had was so incredible. Now, that image had been tarnished over the last several years. Um, but still, I, I have a very good friend up in New York City. He's an imam uh, named uh, Faisal Abdul Rauf. And if you've never met him or never read his book, I really recommend it. But uh, he's written a book that's uh, what's right with America is what's right with Islam. And he talks about our principles and our ideals and how they fit in with what Islam is really about. And what he, what he tells the Islamic world is be angry at the Americans if they don't live up to their principles. But the principles are right. And if they live up to them, you ought to support them. Uh, that's the kind of message that we have to get out. But I guess the, the thing I want to talk and mention mostly here is we in the military, all the military, we're great at after-action reports. We're great at lessons learned. But nine times out of ten, they're lessons that are not learned. And I'm afraid, you know, frankly, the Southeast Asian lessons that were learned through courts and all, we ran away from that as quickly as we could. We started saying, oh, we don't do nation building. We don't do any of these things. Uh, well, that came back to haunt us. I think a lot of lessons the last few years in Iraq have been learned. Uh, they're not all transferable. I hope people will understand some of it for Afghanistan. But that's uh, the where I guess I, I really want to sum up. You know, let's learn the lessons. Let's carry them out. Uh, the military guys, Aaron, I, I really believe don't want to do the rule of law stuff. You know, uh, military guys, it was easy when I came in. You had to move, shoot, and communicate. You know, that, that was a, an easier world. 
Uh, they don't, don't want to go do all these things, and I don't want the military guys doing all these things. Indeed, though, we have to build a capacity. We have to remember that Jack Kennedy, and, and this was not an accident, he signed the implementing legislation for USAID the same day he signed the executive order allowing the wearing of the Green Beret for the American Special Forces. He saw those as tools to win the Cold War, and that's what we see now. Secretary Gates gets that. He sees that we have let all those capabilities atrophy and that we've got to go back and build them up again. Uh, the last thing, and I'll, I'll close off, the last thing I want to say is that Part of living up to those principles, and frankly, we do now have to deliver the message to the world that we're back, that, that the principles are going to be stood by again. Part of living up to those principles are holding ourselves responsible. And when I say that, I mean mostly it's holding officers responsible. The officers in this room, all of us who have served as commission officers, uh, because we were always taught when I was a young cadet that an officer is responsible for everything his unit does or fails to do. And we should say now his or her unit does or fails to do. No more cases like Abu Ghraib where we tend to only prosecute junior enlisted. Uh, young people who were not supervised the way they should have been supervised. Uh, and I'm, I'm big on investigations. I believe you investigate the heck out of everything. You investigate responsibilities. And where you find culpability, you prosecute. And that's what I think we need to do, whether it's people within our own ranks or people within our government. If we're going to say we're back and we're going to say we're living up to our principles, and this maybe is kind of a political statement and maybe some people won't like it, then I say you, you go where the investigation takes you and you prosecute the people who, frankly, have tarnished our reputation. Um, again, I, I think some, and I will just mention, there are some metrics, there are some programs that you actually can show are working. I've just come back from a program in southern Mindanao. Uh, and frankly, I, I recommend to all of our military colleagues that you get to start looking at some of what the armed forces of the Philippines are doing because they get it. They really understand, and frankly, USAID is their primary partner in this. They understand it's better to win people over, to give them a voice in their government, to give them a sustainable livelihood. Uh, there's a program there called Growth with Equity in Mindanao. Uh, and what this program has done, you know, when you, when you start talking about metrics and, and effects of things, this program has taken 30,000 insurgents out of the insurgency. These are guys that still have their weapons. They've not been demobilized. They've not been disarmed. But they have not committed one act of violence in the last 10 years. And the splinter group that broke off from them, who are their cousins and their brothers, they've refused to join them again. And so consequently, there, there still are evil people. The military can focus on a much tinier group of people that has to be addressed by force because this other side has worked. So anyway, I'll shut up and we'll let everybody attack Aaron now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in keeping with the pattern established in the earlier panels, that's a, a very rich spread we have there, so I uh, invite all of you to start, start sampling. Please. Uh, Randy Mora, student at GW Law. Uh, I have a question. In, in terms of taking at least the first three panelists' statements together, it seems with the very optimistic future the first two paint uh, with you know, various humanitarian crises, et cetera, and then the last two statements of the military not having such an active role in all this. It seems there's first this allusion towards, I don't know how many people in the room are familiar with Thomas Barnett's Pentagon's new map, and sort of moving to this model where we realize the Cold War has ended and we can't just build our forces in that sense. How do you reconcile the civilians have to do this job? It's not the military's problem, but humanitarian crises make it impossible for civilians to go in. With the military's perspective on, we don't want to be involved, but civilians can't do the job. 
Um, I, I know that sort of presents the problem of the conference, but I'm not seeing uh, any discourse on where that middle ground sits, where it is somebody's problem and it gets addressed, and given the realities that abandoning humanitarian problems are what lead to the insurgencies we have, and that in the modern era with people like Hugo Chavez, they only rise because, well, quite frankly, the, the, the people on the ground don't get the needs they have, and we need to meet them somehow. So what, what middle ground do we find to solve that problem? Well, I you take that, General Dunlop, for starters. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think we offered some solutions. I think the Columbia, what, what has happened in Columbia is a good case study where we invested some, we had some people down there, we had trainers. I think everybody agrees these days that the face of a counterinsurgency or the face of a relief effort ought to be indigenous people in every opportunity because they know the culture, they know the language and everything else. So how can we leverage our capabilities to improve their capability of taking care of themselves? I would say one thing, though. Uh, it isn't fashionable, but if you study the success that General Petraeus had, there was a lot of killing and capturing going on during that period. Uh, you, those of you know, uh, the number of young Iraqi males in detention went from, I think, 16,000 in 2006 to hit a high of 25, 26,000. And if you read Woodward's book, he will tell you that killing individual people helped an end was, in fact, the newspaper report says it was more important than the surge itself, was what he reported to be special ops. So it's a blend of things. It's a holistic approach. It's not going to be one size fits all because the, the, they really are, it's hard to compare Venezuela, that challenge with Iraq, uh, because I would, you know, there are different sources for the instability, and we're not going to be able to do it all. What I was advocating uh, was that uh, it is what it is today. The military has the capability, the military will continue to be used. But what I am, I guess, inartfully saying is we may want to look at a Goldwater-Nichols Act for USAID where we actually fundamentally sh start to shift the burden. I'm not talking about a flip-the-page type of solution here, but as we start to move into the 21st century, uh, we still have to have a powerful, potent, agile, and very frightening military to anybody who might think that they wanted to do something big. Uh, that's not my, that's not, I'm advocating that. In fact, if you, that's what I'd like to see because our military is beaten to death. You know, we're down to scraping the bottom of the National Guard barrel. Uh, that's not the military that has the capability of taking on the dear leader when he comes across the parallel. I don't know. We, we would have. I don't know whether we could take him on right now. But my point is, is that maybe in 20 years or so, 25, as we fundamentally think all this through logically and in a way that legally allows us to shift mission of the armed forces to what they were originally designed to do, and have and build a robust capability civilian-wise. And I agree very much with both sides of me as far as where this is going. That's what I'm advocating. A structured, thought through process under some type of legislation that begins to allow us to change the paradigm when it comes to humanitarian aid, uh, building the rule of law, what have you, and so that we can actually take the assets that the military do need and give them all the best tools that, that are technologically capable. So when the U.S. Armed Forces do show up, uh, it's uh, Negotiations have failed, but they will certainly have the ability uh, to be on time, on target. And uh, so that's, that, that's what I was saying on that point as far as I'm not saying just strip them and, and leave them. I'm just saying we have to do a gradual process of, of a fundamental thinking in, uh, when, uh, as to how we approach the world. We should uh, uh, ask questions first, think it through, and then shoot later is what I'm saying. Bill. Yeah, I wanted to mention, you know, a lot of these capabilities exist. Uh, they do exist in the civilian realm. Now, I spent most of my time since I left the Army with non-governmental organizations, and what I tell military audiences is some NGOs are as good and professional as any military unit they've ever been in. Uh, many of them I wouldn't hire to, uh, to walk my dog. 
Many of them are really bad. Uh, when it comes to contractors, some of them are very good and very honest. Some are horrible. Uh, and I think the example of reconstruction in Iraq, uh, it, it's all about what I think Dwight Eisenhower warned us about on a military industrial complex. Uh, I've read that reconstruction of Iraq so far, which as you know hasn't gone very well, in real dollars has cost three times as much as the reconstruction of Japan. So again, when we're holding people responsible, and this is part of building up AID capabilities again, uh, we ought to see some war profiteers being, uh, quite frankly, prosecuted for war profiteering and for cheating the government. But when I talk about these capabilities existing in the civilian realm, I'd, I'd say probably the last time we used all the levers of national power was probably World War II. You know, when we could turn out a strategic bomber every 17 minutes, you know, a couple of Liberty ships every day, you know, heck, this time we couldn't even up armor Humvees. You know, why are we so less capable today than we used to be? Uh, when I, I used to work for uh, J-9 Experimentation down at Joint Forces Command, and they do the big exercises, at, as most people would know them, and they did one a couple of years ago on West Africa. And the trigger of the scenario was going to be an outbreak of, of avian influenza. Well, and of course, you know, for West Africa, Nigeria is the anchor. And that's good or bad. It either drags it down or it can stabilize the area. So the head of J-9 Experimentation came to me. I was at a mid-sized development NGO at the time. And he said, how many people can you put your hands on who have worked in Nigeria? So I went to my database, and I was able to go back and tell him, well, about the equivalent of a U.S. Army infantry battalion, about 550 people, and some of them are self-propelled laundry bags. You know, they're, they're, they're Joe Snuffy. Others are that battalion commander. And, you know, he said, well, do they, do they speak any of the languages? And I said, well, which dialects do you want? Uh, in our 125 people in our headquarters here in Washington, we, we took a survey. We tested people. We, we spoke 30 languages, 30 languages at a 3-3 level or better out of 125 people. Uh, we had over 20 people who spoke fluent Arabic. I mean, the, the capabilities are there. It's up to state CRS and other people in the interagency to figure out how to harness those capabilities, and then we can support these efforts the way they should be supported. Aaron, please. Um, what's, your, what's your name? Who was? Randy, Randy I, I think you um, put your finger on a fundamental contradiction um, with a lot of eloquence and brilliance, and I think you're gesturing um, at a contradiction that, that structures our civilian society and our <laughs> civilian leadership. So this is not something to blame the military for. Um, we haven't reconciled some of these issues ourselves. But I do want to say that one of, and I can't give you a, uh, as General Dunlop was saying, a one-size-fits-all answer, um, but I can tell you part of why I can't give you that answer. And that is that Part of the contradiction that I think fundamentally structures our society is that we don't talk about the ways in which our military support for dictators has a corrosive effect on our reputation around the world. Now, we obviously face a choice in many societies of whether to support a military or a regime that tortures its own people or to give up on what we would see as stability. But when we have a foreign policy that is so driven by these kinds of supports, people around the world hate us for that. And we don't talk about that. And until we talk about that, I don't think we're going to be, uh, be able to answer your question. Rosa. Thanks. Uh, this, this conversation, especially on this panel, but all through the day, has been, been so rich that I think we now have topics for about 10 future conferences, uh, because we can't hope to address all of the threads, all pull together all the threads that are kind of out there. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, raise a question for you, Aaron, not, 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 because, not because I disagree with your critique. I essentially do agree with your critique uh, that our culture has become militarized in various ways that have become detrimental to 
our society broadly, but also detrimental to the military itself, which has been asked to do take on tasks that are it is not particularly well equipped to do. That, that's that's left us with a military that has been very badly burdened. Uh, you know, we, we've got a lot, and, and part of this is a big failure of imagination on on our part, as you said, that some of the kinds of conversations that should have taken place didn't take place, or they take place only in a very muted way. And that, that's a loss to all of us, uh, to civilian and military alike, when we can't have the kinds of very wide-ranging conversations that I think we've actually had today. Um, but, but how do we go, let me ask, challenge you to go from that critique uh, where we, if we don't want to be a society that, due to total failure of imagination, assumes that we can't, po we don't have the competence, or or we can't just, we're not creative enough to think of anything other than, well, heck, let's just send the, the Marines and the Air Force and the Army and the rest of the military to solve this problem for us. Um, I see that as just as Rachel Kleinfeld said earlier that the rule of law is is fundamentally a culture as much as it is a matter of institutional arrangements and legislation and so forth. Uh, this is a pretty deep cultural problem. Um, it's not just a question of you know we can shift some money from one budget to another. We can have 10,000 more AID people or foreign service officers. We can do that stuff, and I think I, I think and I hope that some of that stuff will get done in the next 10 years. But the the deeper failures of, of imagination. Nation are are very deep in our culture, and and how on earth can we <laughs> go from your critique to how would we become a society that is capable of having those kinds of richer conversations, thinking more creatively about solutions, about about both our own practices here at home and about our role in the world, because that that, that seems to me to be the challenge, and we fall back on having the same conversations and doing the same things, not much of the time, not because we we don't know that. There are deep flaws, but but it's just too hard, and we can't figure it out. And I just wondered if you can figure it out for us. Um, uh oh, thank you for the question, um, and I so appreciate the opportunity to it's Mrs. Dunlap. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's yours. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> that's pretty cool, Charlie. Oh. <laughs> no. There we go. <laughs> I, think Ms. I think, yeah, I was going to say Mrs. Dunlop doesn't want to hear about demilitarization. Um, oh, uh, yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. Maybe you're gesturing at a partial answer to Rosa's question. I, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk, but mostly actually to listen and learn about some of these difficult issues. And... I don't really want to talk about demilitarization because I don't think that's possible or desirable, but maybe we could talk about thoughtful militarization. And maybe this is uh, uh, naive academia, um, uh, naive academic perspective, but I don't even see thoughtful militarization um, so much about being about any change in policy, you know, lower budget, higher budget, less forward deployed, more forward deployed. But I do think that we have to at least have conversations in the public about some of these issues. Um, so the project that um, we're starting at Brown is designed to simply start to do research about the extent to which different pockets of society either are or are not militarized. Um, for example, um, in the presidential primary season, we did not even have a debate about whether the United States is at the center of an empire and whether that's a good thing or not. We didn't even ask the question. Now, it's a consensus among a lot of scholars that we have an empire, but we can't talk about that as a society. So I would say the most important step forward would be to do research, put it into the hands of the media, put it into the hands of the military, put it into the hands of the Congress, and keep talking about it. It's not a very satisfying answer. Could, could I make a, just a short comment on that? I think it's important in this discussion of militarization, and Andy Basevich, has, as you know, has written a whole book on, on the su subject of the militarization of foreign policy. But in a lot of ways, I think we should separate the affection that the American people have for the armed forces. And they have that affection because they are seeing young people do things they do. And so and, but that doesn't necessarily translate to them wanting to be in a militarized society. They don't live that way. They don't conduct their, their 
everyday life in a military. They don't have that sense. And so I think that there is this great admiration for this smaller and smaller sliver of American society that serves in uniform. In fact, a lot of people can't understand why people go into the military, uh, especially when the, the war was at its height. So I think that before we Part of the examination that I would say that you might want to do with your project is to separate those two ideas. Are there parts of American society that have been dangerously militarized? Yes. Guess what I think it is? And there's been a book written on it, Police. You know, police, all these SWAT teams and everything else, that's a relatively recent sort of thing where they have replaced kinetic force with the authority of the badge. It says there's been a cultural shift. So there are manifestations, but I think it's important that we, we not seek to diminish that, the positive affection that the American people have. Because if you have an all-volunteer force, the American people better love you because they won't send their sons and daughters in harm's way and give you that responsibility unless they're satisfied that it has values that they respect if they don't live them themselves. Very, very briefly, I don't think those issues can be separated. Affection and love and respect and honor for the military are good, but when they rise to the level of uncritical affection, love, honor, and respect, then you have the problem Rosa talked about, which is the assumption that we have a foreign policy problem. The military can handle it because they're great, they're perfect, so let's just dump it on them. Ma'am. Um, as a social worker and having been a great crisis counselor, so I appreciate it. I guess when I think about the militarization, I've never, I'm not familiar with the things, everything you were saying, but I really appreciate that, that way of thinking about it, because one of the ways I think that shows itself is not that I want the affection of the Amer American people like, like the Army, but funds. It, when there's a problem with money in this country, the first place we think of cutting is services to poor people, services to um, these kinds of violence, domestic violence, rape, where a whole portion of the population doesn't have much of a voice because they're trying so hard to be able to buy food or they're trying so hard to get medical care. So in a way, there are certain things our society values to pay for and certain that it doesn't. And I would say that's also part of homeland security, which others have said. Well, I, if, if you read uh, General or President Eisenhower's last speech, you know, every dollar spent is a theft from a starving person. And there is that, that trade-off. The problem, I think, is that the American people corporately recognize is that we're facing adversaries that have such terrible capabilities and the motivation to do it, to harm us in any way they can. And they know that it's going to take a lot to make sure that that doesn't happen. I don't think you'll find anybody in the military who doesn't understand that that horrific trade-off has to be made. And I often think about it when you go to conferences and other countries are criticizing us, and I say this as an Air Force guy, they aren't paying to have precision-guided weapons. You know, so when they go to war, they're going to war with done bombs. The American taxpayer has gone to extraordinary lengths to try to prevent innocent human beings from being killed inadvertently in conflict. So we've, this country has made tremendous sacrifices to try to make the 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 military as efficient and as effective as it can be, given that sometimes we are the only ones standing between, <laughs> you know, chaos. But we do have to make these judgments, and they're very difficult judgments, and we need to keep that in the forefront, that every time we spend a dollar on a weapon, that means somebody's not going to get prenatal care. So it's part of the conversation. It's a zero-sum game. And it's going to be more that way in the future. That's why there are going to be the, the president has some very hard decisions to make. And it's not about politics. It's very difficult decisions based on uncertain and unknowable circumstances. Professor Rishkov. Um, well, thank you.
you. Uh, it's a fascinating panel, and for many, many reasons. But I guess the issue I would raise for you to think about is that what's very unique in the Republic's history is the fact that we have a, um, a volunteer military. For so long, the citizen soldier was the core of the uh, myth and uh, mythology of the Republic. And I think what I've been teaching both in this military side and the civilian side for years, and the, the chasm that is, that is created between the two cultures is part of the problem, I think, Aaron. And I think the idea that we should not have a sense of public service required by all Americans somewhere between high school and college, whereby they would have either a form of civilian corps service or military service to choose, is part of the issue. And as you know, from the military, part of the experience of Southeast Asia was a rejection of the draft, because getting people in who did not want to be part of the military was a very dark period during our, that, that particular experience. So I think it, uh, uh, if you're looking for a topic, the issue of how to understand the concept of citizenship in the 21st century for United States citizens and what we expect of individuals, that would be a very fascinating sort of uh, issues to explore. Re what, yeah. Read Starship Troopers. Well, first of all, how many of you read Starship Troopers? It used to be on the Marine Corps okay, reading now, list. Now, the reason the general likes Starship Troopers is because it's a very Roman... I didn't say I liked it. I said <laughs> it's an important book well, I think people need to read, especially as you go into, potentially, if you believe Dave Crane, this dark period of the future... Where society, where how does a democracy survive under extreme stress? As you know, Starship Troopers also is a Roman solution because the Romans would not let anyone hold high public office unless they had previously served in the military. So that's the concept in, in a core of Starship Trooper. But, like I say, I'm not saying I like it. I'm this, saying it's important. I don't have a problem I with did. it. The second issue is this has been a very uh, American centric. So where is Europe on your issues of humanitarian issues? Where is the African continent on the issues of humanitarian? Where is Latin America on these issues? So you have to ask, why is this always an American issue about humanitarian commitment and not where is the rest of the globe? And the third point is, as you know, for those of us who have seen it up close, experience of ISAF have not been the most satisfactory vis-a-vis -vis the idea of having a joint approach. So I put those three issues on the table of the, for the people to think about in relation to the future conferences and where you feel about it today. Well, let me let me comment about the uh, the issue related to uh, where America's place is in the world right now, and and I I think we're at a at a crossroads uh, historically, and I think a hundred years from now they may look back as was this the beginning of the diminishing of American power in the 21st century. Uh, we're very much challenged in many ways. One is we've lost the moral high ground. So we have a lot of work to do on that. And it took us a long time. I entered the military when Rusty Calley was being uh, prosecuted in, at Fort Benning, Georgia. I remember running by where he was in house arrest. He was out back uh, barbecuing. And that's how I started my military career was the Mile Eye Massacre. And we worked hard with the DOD Law of War program to not have any more mile eyes. And we've already concluded that what's taken place in Iraq and certain areas has really diminished us morally. And that's, that, that makes me uh, sad because I, I, I served my country based on that principle that we uh, always entered a conflict with the moral side in our kit bag. And I'm not so sure we have that anymore. I think that, uh, let me finish then, I'll, excuse me, Charlie, but, the, mm -hmm. but also I think we're diminished economically. We're blamed by many people in the world for this uh, economic situation, rightfully or wrongfully. It is what it is, just like the moral high ground issue, but it is what it is. And I think that uh, other countries like Brazil, India, uh, the European Union are going to take other measures to preserve uh, their economies. And uh, whether it'll be economic nationalism, as I had mentioned earlier, but we're, we're diminished economically as well. So we're diminished morally, we're diminished economically, and folks, we're diminished militarily. Uh, we played right into Iran's hands. This is the greatest thing that we could have ever done is go in swinging a baseball bat and not thinking exactly what 
the strategic implications are related to what we're about to do. Uh, and uh, we have spent a lot of treasure, but more importantly, we have lost a lot of good sons and daughters uh, that we did, frankly, didn't have to do. So uh, we are a different country than we were eight, eight years ago, and we have to appreciate that. That doesn't mean we can't come back. I mean, Americans are great at coming back and coming back better. But I'm just saying is, is that we are a different country than we were uh, before uh, September 11th of 2001, and we have to look at ways as to how we can project our power uh, smartly as well as militarily to ensure that uh, – that we do it in a way that uh, continues to allow our ability to uh, uh, exist in the global community. General Excuse Dunlap, me. if you could briefly comment, and then we'll give the last word to Aaron Belkin. We do need to stop at 4.30 so that we can uh, have Mr. Johnson have his opportunity to speak. General Dunlap. Just really quickly, uh, you know, when we start thinking about the rule of law, we start thinking of Milai massacre, and then you start thinking of Abu Ghraib. We have to remember, Stephen Ambrose in his book, Americans at War, made an observation, which I think we need to keep in mind. He says, he says, when you put young men with weapons in a foreign country during wartime, sometimes terrible things happen that you wish never happened. It's been that way since the beginning of time, and it'll be that way always. So when we think about using the military and, and these incidents, don't think that it's something about our current army or, or the people happen to be in during that, that period of time. It's a phenomenon of what happens to human beings when they get under extreme stress. It's not an excuse. It's, it's not something that we don't work against, but it's a reality that we have to think about as we look towards the future where we live in an environment where you have instantaneous news and constant recording of everything that happens. And that's a, so when we, we're going to have to learn ways of dealing with that. Aaron. Um, I've learned a lot from everyone on the panel and from the questions, and I would love to have the last word, and I'll take it, but I've had more airtime, and so, William Stubner, do you want the last word? No, I, I think everyone had pretty much said what most, what most of us believe. Uh, I really don't believe, and maybe I'm naive, I really don't believe that most of our military colleagues want a militarization of society. Uh, do we undervalue other parts of society? We most certainly do. Not just social workers, but teachers. I mean, come on. They, they're building our future, and we don't want to pay them hardly anything. Uh, so I, I think there there is an imbalance, but... Uh, you know, I, I still, you know, I thank God that we have do have a military that believes in civilian control, and it's an instrument. What we just need to remember, and again, going back to Galula, is these things need to be 80 percent civilian and t maybe 20 percent military at the most. And what we have done, not just in the last eight years, but what we have done because of our maybe fixation on the military, is we've turned that on its head. And so we just got to get things back in balance. Thank you, Bill. If you would uh, join me in thanking our panelists.